promise of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. That promise, according to Joel chapter 2, is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That was the great promise that God made. And Peter spoke about it there on the day of Pentecost. And that promise is not for a few people here and there. It's not for the elites. We talked about that. It is for every, every believer. Every one of you that are here today, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for you. I want you to grasp that. If you get nothing else, I want you to understand that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is intended for. It's not just available. It is intended for every believer. We saw last week as we looked in Acts chapter 8. And if you weren't here last week, not because I preached a great message, but there's some tremendous teaching there. I challenge you to go on YouTube and, and listen to that message. But we looked at Acts chapter 8 as Stephen, excuse me, Philip went to the, to the city of Samaria and began to preach Jesus. People were being saved. But we saw there that the apostles and the leaders of the early church expected and desired every believer would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism is, is not the same as salvation. It's not something that occurs necessarily at the moment of salvation. It is a separate work of God in our life. The receiving of the baptism of the Holy Spirit or being filled with the Holy Spirit. And the, the apostles recognized, and we saw this last week, that there, when someone is filled with the Holy Spirit, that there is an outward, a physical evidence that is manifested, that demonstrates the person has been filled with the Holy Spirit. And we saw that without a doubt in that chapter 8 of uh, Acts. And we're going to look at some other verses in a few minutes. You say, why are you preaching on that again today? I made an emphasis three, months out of, three weeks out of this month because today is Pentecost Sunday. Today is the celebration in the church of what took place in Acts chapter 2 when God poured out his spirit. And that promise is still taking place. It is still being poured out upon us today. And we're going to look at some more passages in just a few minutes. But before I do that, I want to ask you a question. I'm going to share a passage of scripture and I want to ask you a question. But look with me at, at Matthew chapter 28 verses 18, 19, and 20. You know these verses well it's at the end of the book of Matthew these are the last verses of Matthew Jesus is giving his last command as far as Matthew sees it before he ascends to the father and Jesus came and spoke to them saying all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth Jesus is stating this all authority has been given to me go therefore make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I commanded you and lo I am with you always even to the end of the age so here's my question out of that those verses does Jesus have all authority in your life does Jesus have all authority in your life does he have the authority to baptize you in the Holy Spirit Jesus is the baptizer. John chapter 1, when Jesus is, is coming to be baptized, when he's baptized, in John chapter 1, verse 33, John the Baptist, the one who baptized Jesus, said this about Jesus. He says, I did not recognize him. And now what he means by that is John and Jesus were cousins and saw each other as they grew up, no doubt as cousins do from time to time. And throughout that time, John says, I did not recognize him. I didn't know this was the, the Messiah. This was the promised one. He says, I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, 
This is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. John says, when you, the, the, the Lord told me, when I see the Spirit descending and resting on a man, this is the one. Why? Because in Isaiah chapter 42, God says, I will put my Spirit upon my servant. And that's what he did on Jesus. And John saw the, the dove descending from heaven, resting on Jesus. He realized, this is my my cousin but this is the promised Messiah this is the one and he rec recognized that this was the one who would baptize his followers in the Holy Spirit but in order for any of us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit we must have submit to the Lord's authority he will not force his authority on any one of us. You are the only one that can stop Jesus from baptizing you in the Holy Spirit. You are the only one who can release that authority to him. Just as God won't force you to do anything that you don't want to do, he's not going to make you go to Africa and be a, 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 a missionary in Africa. He, he's not going to make you go to, now he may call you there, but you have an answer. You can say, yes, Lord, here am I, send me. Or you can say, no, Lord, you're crazy, I ain't going. Huh? You say you'd never talk to God like that? I don't care what word you do. If that first word is there, that two-letter word, no, it really doesn't matter what else you say after that. Does God have authority today? All authority in your life. We're going to come back to that at the end of the message. But I want to move on. We went through Acts chapter 2. We looked at Acts chapter 8 last week. Today we're going to start in Acts chapter 10. And I am going to take time. I'm going to read a lot to you today. And it's all going to be on the screen. Hopefully you can read it clearly. I want you to follow along with me. Acts chapter 10. We're going to read the entirety of the chapter. Because I want you to grab the whole story. It says, now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius. A centurion. That means a commander of a hundred men okay he was in the Roman army he was a commander of 100 men he was not a small guy you know commanding five or ten 100 men a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually so he was unusual he didn't worship the Roman gods or the Greek gods he worshiped the God of the Jews. He worshiped Jehovah God. Verse 3. About the ninth hour of the day, that would be three o'clock in the afternoon, he clearly saw a vision saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. And Cornelius, fixing his eyes on him and being much alarmed, I think I would be too, <laughs> said, what is it, Lord? And the angel said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. His giving, his, his giving to the Jewish people as well as his prayers had been seen by God. Verse 5, now dispatch some men to Joppa. Joppa was 30 miles down the coast. Caesarea, Caesarea was a coastal city. Joppa was a coastal city 30 miles apart. Send some men down the coast to Joppa. I lost my place. And send for a man named Simon who is also called Peter we know who that is he is staying with a man named Simon so Simon's staying with Simon you get that don't get confused whose house is by the sea when the angel who was speaking to him had left he Cornelius summoned two of his servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. So these servants were probably house servants, men who probably had authority within his household as well as one of his most devout soldiers. Verse 8. 
after he explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. On the next day, as they were going on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up to the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. So it's the next day, and about noon, Peter's up on the rooftop where there is usually a place on those in, in that area where you could uh, hang out, kind of like a porch area, a deck, whatever, except it was their roof. So he's up there, he's on the roof at noon praying. Verse 10, but he became hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations down the house, he fell into a trance. I'm going to say he fell asleep and took a nap. And he saw the sky opened up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. A voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. You're hungry. Go ahead, kill and eat. Verse 14, but Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. This probably had reptiles in it and bugs in it and those kind of things. Peter says, I don't eat that stuff. That's against the law. Verse 15. And again, a voice came to him a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times. In other words, this, this command to kill and eat, Peter's, no, I can't. This is unclean. God's response, what God has clean, no longer consider unholy. Three times. And immediately the object was taken up into heaven. Verse 17. Now while Peter was greatly perplexed in his mind as to what the vision which he had seen might be. Okay, so get this. Peter's seen all this, but he didn't understand the thing. What was that all about? You know, that's, I can just, what was that all about? But suddenly, behold, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked what directions for Simon's house, appeared at the gate and calling out, they were asking whether Simon, who was also called Peter, was staying there. So while Peter was reflecting on the vision, the Spirit said to him, I love that. The Spirit said to him, Yes, we can hear the voice of the Spirit, whether it's an audible voice or in our spirit, one way or the other. But the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. But get up, go downstairs, and accompany them without misgivings, for I have sent them myself. Peter went down to the men and said, Behold, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for which you have come? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a righteous and God-fearing man, well spoken of by the entire nation of the Jews, was divinely directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to, this, to his house and hear a message from you. So he invited. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. 30-mile journey probably took them a full day or maybe a day and a half. They were tired. It's time to rest for the night the next day. So, uh, now, now first of all, let me explain to you. Inviting three Gentile men into a home where he as a Jew was staying would have been no good. Strictly against the Jewish law. You don't have Gentiles in your home and you don't go into Gentile homes. You don't eat meals with Gentiles and you don't invite Gentiles to eat meals with you. That's just the way it was. That's, that's what the word of God said. Come out from among them and be separate. So Peter is now beginning to gain hold of what this vision meant. What God has declared holy do not call unclean any longer. Okay? So he's inviting these Gentiles in. Verse 23, so he invited them in, gave them lodging, and on the next day he got up and went away with them and some of the brethren from Joppa, so that would have been some of the Jewish brethren from Joppa, accompanied him. On the following day, so they traveled that day and, and into the next, on the following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worked worshiped him. Can you just imagine? But Peter raised him up saying, stand up. I'm a man just like you, buddy. Okay, I'm putting my English in there. Excuse me. I'm just a man. As he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. 
And Peter said to them, You yourselves know how law unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner, a Gentile, or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. Peter got the message. That is why I came without even raising in my any objection when I was sent for. So I asked for what reason you have sent for me. So I asked that of you. Verse 30. Cornelius said, four days ago to this hour, I was praying in my house during the ninth hour. And behold, a man stood before me in shining garments. And he said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Therefore, send to Joppa and invite Simon, who is called Peter, to come to you. He is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you immediately and you have been kind enough to come now then we are all here present before God to hear all that you've been commanded by the Lord opening his mouth Peter said I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality praise God but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him the word which he sent to the sons of Israel preaching peace through Jesus Christ he is Lord of all you yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea starting from Galilee after the baptism which John proclaimed you know of Jesus of Nazareth how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him so remember this is only weeks after maybe a couple three months something like that no more than six months after Jesus died was raised from the dead ascended so they're still got all these things kind of fresh in their mind we are witnesses of all these things he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. Verse 40, God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible. Now they may not have known about that. I don't know how far the news had spread, but Peter had seen him and Peter was bold enough to say, he didn't say, and I think God raised him up on the third day. He said, God raised him up. I saw him. On the third day, and granted that he become visible, verse 41, not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand, that is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one whom has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin sins now here's where it gets amazing while Peter was still speaking these words Peter still preaching the message the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message all the circumcised believers so the Jewish men that came with Peter that day maybe men and women they witnessed what was about to take place all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. How did they know that? Verse 46. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. So there was an evidence. It was clear that God had poured out his spirit. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who've received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can't he? So Peter saying, These are definitely born again believers they've been filled with the Holy Spirit let's get them baptized that's how important water baptism is let's get them baptized because now there are Gentiles sharing in the message and church if you go back and look at the Old Testament that's God's plan from the very beginning this was what God had in store from the beginning and the Jews were God's chosen people not because they were something special in themselves but God says I need you and I'm going to use you to bring the message the the hope and the reality of Jesus Christ the Messiah in the world now that has happened now the Gentiles get to begin to hear the message so he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Christ then they asked him to stay on a few days hallelujah I thought of this as I was reading this story and thinking an angel shows up to Cornelius's house and commands him to send for Peter so Peter can preach the word to them why didn't, the, why didn't the angel just do it? The angel was there. 
Why didn't the angel just say, gather your family together. I want to share the message of Christ with you. Because church, I want you to hear this today. It's important. God has chosen us, his disciples, to share the good news. He could send angels and in the tribulation, at the end of the seven years of tribulation, right there toward the very end, God is going to send angels out to spread the word so that not one man, one woman on the earth can be able to say, I never heard the gospel. They're going to hear it through angels in the very end. But today, it's our, our privilege but as well our task, our duty, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Does God have the authority to do things His way? Yes, He does. He's Lord of all. He can do it His way. This vision that, that God gave to Peter made it so very clear to Peter, obviously, but to all of us, that the gospel was not just for the Jews anymore. The gospel was for everyone. So you've got to imagine this three months, six months, however long, we don't really know exactly how long after the resurrection. Up to this time, the church was only Jewish people. Only Jewish people were being saved. But now things were going to explode beyond that. The kingdom of God had been made available to all nations. Hallelujah. Peter and his, and his companions recognized it when they saw the gift of the Holy Spirit poured out on them. Because why? How did they know? Because they heard them speaking in tongues and glorifying or prophesying before God. There was a physical evidence in every, every instance of people being filled in the, with the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Every single one, there is spoken of some physical evidence, some outward display of God's baptizing them in the Holy Spirit. It's not done so secretly. It's not done within the heart. Salvation is in the heart. I can't see that you've been born again. You can testify to me that you've been born again, but I can't witness it necessarily except maybe in days ahead when I begin to see your life changed and turned around. But there's some people that are good folks and there's not a huge difference in their life when they get saved, though they still need to be saved because they are still sinners, but it's hard to see. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, always there is an outward sign, an outward evidence. And what we believe, what, what I believe the scripture makes clear is that evidence is the speaking in tongues. It's the one thing that shows up again and again. So from chapter 11, chapter, or from chapter 10, we go into chapter 11. And I'm going to touch this real quick because it's so neat. So in chapter 11, Peter ends up having to give account. Verses 1 through 3 says this. Now the apostles and the brethren who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word. This is astonishing news. And now it begins to scatter abroad and everybody begins to hear it. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those who were circumcised... So the Jewish believers took issue with him saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Oh my, what have you done? Huh? That, that, I mean, that would have been the normal response. But Peter takes time and lays out the story before them. We're not going to read all of that. That's in verses 4 through 15. He tells everything that happens. And then at the end of that, in verse 16 and 17, Peter's conclusion is simply this. I didn't do anything but preach the word to them. God saved them. God filled them with the Holy Ghost. How do I know? Because I heard him speaking with tongues and prophesying. I didn't do it. God did it. And in verse uh, 16 and 17, this is what it says. Peter says, I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized you with water, but he, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, God gave them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord. Who was I that I could stand in God's way? So Peter just says, he, I, didn't, I didn't do it. 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 I, didn't do it. I mean, that's kind of what he's saying. The result was that everybody realized that God had reached out. Verse 18 says, when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles repentance that leads to life. Can you say, praise the Lord? I'm a Gentile. I don't have any Jewish blood in me that I know of. I'd have been left out. If this hadn't happened, if God hadn't made the plan, I would have been left out. 
praise God for salvation and the baptism. Amen. So that's Acts chapter 10 and 11. I'm going to jump way ahead to Acts chapter 19. The last passage of scripture. The last instance of people being filled with the Holy Spirit in the, in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 19 beginning at verse 1. Verses 1 through 7 says. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth. Paul passed through the upper country. So that would have been up through Macedonia. And he came around to Ephesus and found some disciples. Okay, let that sink in. He found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him, that is in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. So let's look at this passage of scripture. First of all, the, the first question is where there's a little bit of controversy or differencing in thoughts is that phrase, he found some disciples in Ephesus. Disciples of who? Disciples? of what? Well, some believe that they were disciples of John the Baptist because they'd been baptized into John's baptism. But I think most, I know I have come to believe that they were disciples of Jesus because Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Why would he have asked them that if they were just disciples of John's? But they were disciples of Jesus. So when you believed in Jesus, did you receive the Holy Spirit? So it's my opinion, I believe I'm in, in line up with many others, that these were born again believers who had heard of and had faith in Jesus Christ, but they had not been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Paul's first question to them though, did you receive the Holy Spirit? It again emphasizes how important the early church thought the baptism of the Holy Spirit was. If you've been saved, did you receive the Holy Spirit? The first thing out of his mouth, the first thing he wants to know about, it was that important. And they did not consider it an automatic. Just because you've been saved, you received the Holy Spirit. As some believe today, that once you're saved, you've received the Holy Spirit. No, Paul says, if you believe, did you? Why? Because because you don't necessarily receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit when you're saved. It's a separate work of God. Then in verse 3, it talks about what then to where you were you baptized in. They said into John's baptism, a baptism of repentance. John's baptism wasn't about conversion to Christianity. It was simply a repentance from sin as God always called his people to, to, to repent, to turn from their wicked ways and turn back to God. And that's what John's baptism was about. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that's where they had been baptized in. But Jesus, the thing that Jesus commanded, go and baptize him in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It was a baptism of faith in believing in Jesus Christ. It was a baptism into, into Christianity. Yes, it was a repentance as well, but it was a baptism into Christianity. So, Paul recognized that they are believers, but they've not been baptized. And what did Paul do immediately? He baptized them in water. How important is baptism in water? Important enough that Paul says you need to do this. If you're here today and you've never been baptized in water, if you're a born again Christian and you've never been baptized in water, I want to tell you it's important that you be baptized. Well, Pastor Mike, can you go to heaven without being baptized? Let me say it like this. If you do not have the opportunity to be baptized in water and the Lord, let's say you, someone came today and got saved. Well, we don't have our baptistry prepared. We wouldn't try to baptize somebody today. I'd probably say, hey, next Sunday we're, we'll baptize you. So you be back next Sunday. We'll baptize you in water. On their way home, they get killed in a car accident. Are they going to heaven? Absolutely, they're going to heaven. They didn't have the opportunity to be baptized at the moment. On the other hand, on the other hand, you get saved and you just put off, put off, refuse. I don't think that's important. I'm not going to tell you you're not going to heaven. 
But I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes because you're living in direct disobedience to God's word. When you're saved, you're to be baptized. And if you have that opportunity, you need to take advantage of it. And I'm saying to anyone that's here today, if you've not been baptized, you talk to me. We'll give you that opportunity very soon for you to be baptized. And immediately after these disciples were baptized in water, Paul laid his hands upon them and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Again, speaking in tongues and prophesying. But again, I, I, I want to just continue to instill this in your hearts and your minds. They were saved, they were baptized, and then there was the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It is a separate work of God from salvation than, than just being saved saved and suddenly you've been filled no it's being baptized over can you be filled with the holy spirit the moment you're saved yes i believe you can i know of people have experienced because they're ready they're receiving there is no other requirements other than you be a born again believer in jesus christ Two, two manifestations, prophesying and speaking in tongues. Again, speaking in tongues continues to show up. And I want to declare to you what I believe to be true, that speaking in tongues is the initial, the first, the initial physical, outwardly manifested, seen and heard, the initial physical evidence that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Why do I say that? Because it's evidenced again and again and again. Even the apostle Paul back in chapter 9 we didn't look at it Paul gets saved on the road to Damascus you know the story gets knocked down off his horse bright light blinded he's at somebody's he goes on to Damascus he's there he's sitting blinded he's seeking God's face he's praying God sends Ananias to him and when Ananias comes to the house Ananias says to him uh, brother Saul the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming has sent me to you that you may regain your sight and and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now it doesn't tell the details of all that taking place, but we assume it does talk about the scales falling off his eyes and Paul receiving his sight, but it doesn't say anything about his being filled with the Holy Spirit, but we assume that that took place as well. It doesn't give us the details. So you say, well, did Paul speak in tongues? Well, in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul makes this statement. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. So yes, Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues as well. So again and again and again, we see this evidence of those who are being baptized in the Holy Spirit receiving the evidence of speaking in tongues. So I hope you understand that this morning. Now I want to come back to this magazine because I know not everybody got it. We have more of them out in the foyer. I encourage you to take one home. First of all, the first two articles in here are absolutely the two best things I've ever heard on the subject of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So much so that we're going to take time to read out loud to you the second article because I believe it is the best description, the best teaching I've ever heard on how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Okay? So we're going to read through this, and I've got parts of it that are boldened and highlighted, whatever, so that you can pick up on those. Those are things that I find to be very important. But follow along with me as we read this, how to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. There we go. Receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit is actually very easy. Jesus desires to baptize every Christian in his spirit and we desire his will for us. I, I can't overemphasize that. God's will for every believer is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The only qualification you need to experience spirit baptism is that you are saved. There's nothing else that you need, to add, that you need before you ask Jesus to fill you with the spirit. If you are struggling with some sort of sin issue, repent, ask Jesus for fresh forgiveness and proceed to seek him he will not hold his spirit withhold his spirit's power from you the most important step in receiving the baptism is to get close to jesus the baptizer as you can do you feel
more freedom when you pray in the company of others? Then call a few friends to pray with you. Do you find that praying alone enables you to have a, uh, fewer distractions and less, less self-conscious? Then get alone to pray. Either way, Jesus will meet with you. Now, get this. Three phases in receiving spirit baptism are vulnerability, awareness, and cooperation. Number one, vulnerability. There is an underlying principle in receiving anything from God, namely vulnerability. Vulnerability toward God involves humbling ourselves when receiving from Him. How did we experience salvation? We first realized that we could not fix our own sin problem, and then we called on Jesus to save us. We humbled ourselves and prayed. If you had received a physical or emotional healing in the past, what did you do to welcome this miracle? Very likely, you prayed. The Bible says anyone who wants to come to Him, to God, must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. We receive from God most often through prayer. If you want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to draw near in prayer. Prayer is a state of vulnerability. Prayer declares, I cannot meet this need in my life, but God, I believe you can. As scripture above explains, the reason we come to God is because we believe that he exists and that he responds to our seeking. Our job in receiving anything from God is to become increasingly more vulnerable with him. Pray out loud. Doesn't say pray loudly. You don't have to scream at God. Okay? But pray out loud. Lift your hands. Voice your passion for Him. Do not hold yourself back. Give your best effort to lowering your guard moment by moment, trying to yield more and more to Him. Raise your voice a decibel or two and lift your hands an inch higher. In other words, continue to draw near. You may need to pray vulnerable prayers expressing how much you need God. Do it for a few minutes before you sense the next phase beginning to happen. So number one, you must be vulnerable before God. Number two, awareness. After some time of vulnerable vocal prayer, you will become aware of the Holy Spirit's presence falling upon you or stirring you deeply. Jesus is responding as you cry out vulnerably. His presence will not scare you. You will not be out of control. Say that again. You will not be out of control. You will recognize his presence because you have sensed him before. Most likely your new awareness of his presence will be stronger than usual. You may sense that he falls upon you and then his present lifts. This is not because you've made a mistake. This is a common experience. And I want to back that up with my own testimony. I, I've, I've seen it in altar services in my own life. He comes like waves. He comes and then he withdraws and then he comes. He'll draw in. If you will, hallelujah. If you will continue to pursue him, God will continue to move in your direction. Okay? You will find that if you choose to draw near in vulnerability again, his presence will fall on you again. He is surrounding you with his presence, so you will have just enough courage to know that, it is, that it, he is with you, and you step into the final phase. Be vulnerable. Be aware of God's presence. Number three. And I can't, I can't get over how important this is and how often we miss this. Cooperation. So now that the Holy Spirit is being poured out upon you, you must learn to cooperate with His gentle leading. He will not make you speak in the supernatural language called tongues. 
I'm going to say that again. He will not make you speak in supernatural tongues. You must learn to follow his promptings. He will nudge you and give you just enough faith to try to speak out in the new language. But you must choose to cooperate with him. This was where I struggled in receiving the Holy Spirit. On more than one occasion, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, those nudges would come and a word or two would begin to come out of my lips that I didn't understand and I would turn it off because I had the authority and power to do that. I withdrew it from God and I said, no, I, that's, that, that's just me. It wasn't I didn't want to, it's just I didn't think it was right. I wasn't cooperating with God. Does that make sense? Your goal is to offer your physical ability to speak for his use, not your, your own. As long as you are speaking words and sentences you understand in English or Spanish or whatever language you may know, you will be speaking out of your intelligence. Your goal is to try to speak out of your spirit where he is stirring. Often at this point, people begin to experience different types of prompting from the Holy Spirit. Typically, they will get a prompting of some strange sounds or syllables. This is when they should begin to try to speak. If this happens, say the words out loud. Now listen, your brain will try to talk you out of it. People have been filled with the Holy Spirit will agree with you. Your brain will tell you, shut up, you don't know what you're doing. But trust the Holy Spirit's leading when He is upon you. Sometimes people feel a physical urge to speak but are not quite sure what to say. Cooperate with the physical prompting. Take a step of faith and try to give your raw sound to this inner prompting. You may grunt, you may sputter for a few moments, but relax and you will find new syllables beginning to emerge. Yield to the new words, let them flow. You will find that when you begin to speak in this new unknown language your mind can still think your mouth is saying things you don't understand and your mind is thinking other thoughts possibly not necessarily but possibly your mind can still think and you may even try to rationalize what is happening this is normal the apostle paul explained if i pray in tongues my spirit is praying but i don't understand what i am saying that's in first corinthians 14 14 you will not understand the supernatural words you're speaking it is normal to have a mix of inter intellectual questions and spiritual sensation your brain will not recognize the new language and you will likely doubt its authenticity yet your spirit will be released in a new way and you will likely center sense an inner strength from that day forward, you can start and stop speaking in tongues as easily as choosing to yield to the Spirit or not. And I would say amen. You do not need to yell or cry. Sometimes our emotions connect and sometimes they don't. Emotions or the lack of them do not validate the concrete sign that he has given you. Let me say that again. Emotions or the lack of them do not validate the concrete sign that he has given you. Whenever you are praying in the Spirit, you are practicing yielding your voice to the Holy Spirit's promptings. It will become more natural for you to follow him in the days ahead. Romans chapter 8 talks about groanings that are too deep for words. The Holy Spirit prays to us in groanings too deep for words if you are struggling sometimes it can feel difficult to receive something from God because of our misunderstanding or our sense of overwhelming unworthiness if you feel like you are struggling or that there are million reasons why you can't experience this gift it's all right Jesus wants to empower you with the Spirit. Oh, it's so true. Jesus wants to empower you. He will help you. He will fill you. 
As long as you continue to seek Him, He will navigate around any, any barriers you put up and any hang-ups that you may have as long as you continue to pray to receive the gift and you, that you feel you don't deserve. And don't stop seeking to be filled. And I wrote in there, I added again and again. Don't stop seeking to be filled again and again and again. It's something I didn't get into in the book of Acts, but it's there. The disciples, others were filled with the Holy Spirit again and again and again. So as I conclude this morning, and, and that's in all that I just read to you is in this magazine. You can take it home and read it again if you need to. But I want to come back to the question that I began in my message at the beginning. Does Jesus have all authority in your life? Does he have all authority? I think most people... Almost everyone I know, somewhere in their life, has got this closet, this room in their life, in their soul, in their person. That's like, God, that's my room. I don't, I don't want you to go in there. That, that's, I, you know, I just, you don't need to go in there, God. I'm asking you today, let him have all authority. Let him have the authority to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You are that only one that can take away the authority of God's baptizing, baptizing you in the Holy Spirit. He will not fight you. He will not go against your will. He will not force it upon you. But if you want the Holy Spirit, then ask God for it. Don't just stand there and... Ask God for it. Pray, ask God, and prepare to receive it. Just as we read about in this article, be vulnerable for, before God. Be aware of God's presence as you wait for his response. And cooperate with what God is trying to do in you. Yield to God's leading. One more question. If you're here this morning and you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then I'm going to ask you to be very bold and right now stand to your feet right where you are. You're here and you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Whether for the first time or to be filled again, stand to your feet. I'll give you just a moment. I want you to, I want you to be honest with yourself and with God. In a few minutes, not right this moment, in a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to come and stand across the front. I'm going to ask you to stand shoulder to shoulder, not in front and behind each other, but just straight across the front. And I'm going to ask all of you, when you, we get up here, I'm going to begin to ask you to pray. And I'm going to ask you to pray out loud. I'm going to turn some music on. We'll have it loud enough to where you can have some privacy in that. But I want you to pray out loud. And I didn't say pray aloud, but I want you to pray out loud. That's not praying out loud. Okay? I want you to pray out loud. My wife's standing. She's one of the ones that I know. She likes to pray quietly. You can pray quietly, but pray out loud. It's important. I believe it's very important. And begin to ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Then I'm going to come by. And I'm going to begin to pray for you. I'm going to lay my hands upon you as the Apostle Paul did, praying for those disciples in Ephesus. I'm not going to do anything crazy. I'm not going to slap you. I'm not going to knock you down. I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be used by God for that anointing, to allow God's anointing to fall upon you. I believe that God intends for every person. He said he would pour out his Spirit on all flesh. God's promise is for you, every one of you today. And I believe God is going to fill you today with the Holy Spirit, with his power according to that promise. It's not my promise to you, it's God's promise. So when you come, be vulnerable. Destroy your pride, overcome any fears, and just surrender to God. Be aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Be aware that God is around you. Get beyond the questions. Get beyond the, the doubts. And just receive in your, in your spirit, in, your, in the presence of the Lord. And then cooperate with Him.
God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And it may happen before I come to you. I may, I'm may i going to start on one end or the other, and you may be down there, and I'm down here, and you get filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't have to lay hands on you. On the other hand, it may be after I've moved on that the Lord comes by and fills you with the Holy Spirit. It's not about me. It's about you, and it's about God. And if it doesn't happen today, don't give up. Please don't give up. And don't get complacent. Continue to press in and seek. I'm telling you, it took me about a year of pressing in. Week after week, day, every chance I got. Praying in the altars before I received from the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask you to come this morning right now. And I'm going to ask you as we begin to play the music that you begin to seek the Lord and you begin to pray. Ask out loud. God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Channel 10. There we go. Let's begin to enter into his presence. Let's begin to enter into his presence. Hallelujah. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us today with your Holy Spirit. So God, sense to know your spirit in this place today. Oh. Hallelujah. Jesus' name. Lord, fill the cold today, we pray in Jesus' name, uh, with the Holy Spirit and power. Uh, right now, God, begin to give her courage, begin to give her boldness, uh, just to be obedient to the leading of the Spirit. Uh, hallelujah. Jesus, baptize her today uh, in the Holy Spirit right now. Uh, hallelujah. God, let your evidence be seen in her. Oh, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Today, Lord, fill Marty today afresh and anew with the Holy Spirit. A fresh anointing of your spirit and power, God, as we seek your face in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, fresh and filling. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Pray out loud. Come on, church. Let's make some noise in this house. We don't have to be loud, but let's pray. Let's seek the face of God this morning. Oh, my God. 
doesn't have to be in a situation like this in church. I, I know I have a friend that years ago, I haven't seen him in years and years, filled in the parking lot of the church, sitting in his car, praying. God filled him with the Holy Spirit. It's nothing to be afraid of. You say, well, I've asked before. I'm going to tell you, keep asking, keep seeking. That's what the scripture says. Seek and you shall find. Knock, the door shall be opened unto you. You got to keep asking. who did receive father we pray for those who did not we pray god today that you would just do a work in every heart and in every life today we pray god that he's as we enter into revival services next sunday god we pray that the power and the presence of the holy spirit will be real will be tangible and god that many will be filled with the holy spirit even before then but lord even through the revival the souls will be saved god we need a move of the spirit we need you and us we need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. We cannot do the work in the ministry that you've called us to do without you, without the Holy Spirit. We love you today. We give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise his name. Amen. I don't know who turned my music off. Keep it going. Hallelujah.